decisions. Like my apologies. I'm, yeah, that's okay. I'm totally, um, you know, happy to delegate, you know, decision makers. If they're good at making decisions, like if I feel like the outcomes are, you know, in alignment with myself and then I don't mind delegating that. And so I think that people are willing to. And so it's not like we have to always know everything about everything and always feel like we have to be like making all the decisions um, for ourselves. And so I just believe in being able to give people access to as much data as they can because information is power. Right. And right now there's only a select few organizations and individuals that have access to a bunch of data that we don't have access to. And I, so I think opening up that like Pandora's box, so to speak, is, is a decent approach um, to helping us. So um, a quick thought. Back earlier when you were talking, I was like, yeah, you would think that the pandemic, that like a, a virus that's killing off a whole lot of people would have been a common enemy and would have united us. And yet, you know, look what happened. And one of the major missteps was not following the, the advice you just gave. And there might be a scenario. Part of the problem is that we're in such a hot politicized environment for lots of different reasons. And there's a bunch of strategies being applied there. But I think that being honest and transparent and offering up, here's the best we know and let's make decisions together about it would actually have diffused a whole bunch of doubter skeptics and other sorts of people who were like, this is authoritarianism creeping into us. This is Nazism. It's like, wow, people went pretty far over the top. But, but there's a legit, you know, um, there's a woman who's been in the OGM conversations for a while who at one point stopped and said, like, before the pandemic, I didn't trust the government very much at all. And I certainly didn't trust big pharma. And all of a sudden we enter this moment when both of them are saying, must do this. It's like, why am I gonna follow this advice? Right? And, and you couple that with a bunch of really stupid things the CDC did early on and, 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 and so on and so forth. And, and then, I don't know, this is just like a, it's a, it's a, hornet's nest of issues that, that we're, we're walking around here. It is. It's a challenging thing because just having access to the data itself doesn't mean that there's data integrity there. It's, too, right. so it's even more difficult these days with like deep fakes and all this other kind of ideas, how to even feminize the information. So I should asterisk and say access to data, but also knowing that there's a solid foundation of data integrity to go along with that, um, as well as the representation of data. That's kind of like what the book of Physiognomics was talking about. And of course you learned the first time in your psychology stats class, like here's three graphs all representing the same data. And you're now have three different views of what's happening here. And so it's, it's all three of those elements to, in conjunction with one another. I think that it's like really going to really kind of touch on it. And, and my undergrad was econometrics. <clears throat> so I was nominally in e the economics department, but I remember in Econ 101, when we dispensed with externalities in 15 minutes, and I was like, that sounded really interesting. How did that go away so fast? So then I kind of abandoned economic theory because ISO quants and whatever, like macro and micro, didn't make a lot of actual sense to me practically. And, and so I found this professor who was doing econometrics and loved that, and that was kind of what I did. But I've en I ended up calling econ econometrics how to lie with numbers. <laughs> because give me a data set and give me a story you want to tell, and I can massage that data set to tell your story, yeah. right? So it made, me a, it made me a skeptical reader of charts and, 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 sta and stats and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but then, have you read the book, um, The End of Average? I haven't. I actually, I need to put that one on my list because someone had once had told me. About so it. he's not the best writer, but the book is really, really good. And you're like, whoa, okay. Then he starts out with the U.S. Air Force, where when jet fighters show up, all of a sudden they have a lot more crashes. And they're like, what's going on here? And, and like, are, are pilots just not fast enough, sharp enough or whatever? And it turns out, not really. Then somebody has the bright idea of measuring their pilots. And so they measured 3,000 pilots, hand length, arm length, waist, torso, eyes, whatever. They just do measurements. And it turns out that less than 15 or 20%, maybe if the number's even smaller, like 5%, some incredibly small percentage of the pilots were average. Everybody was like really long arms, short torso, whatever. And all of this leads to the invention of the highly modifiable bucket seat, the, the pilot seat that can be adjusted so that 
you can see over the instruments so that you can reach the joystick and the pedals and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, in our cars, the bucket seats are, are the, the, the inheritors of, of that technology. But then like accidents go down because they realize that we don't have an average pilot. And so, and so the author of this book plays this out in place after place after place. Like, like when you look at average stats, they're really misleading half the time. Yeah, and I think that's a really good example of what are we really trying to accomplish at the end of the day? So yeah. the objective is for accidents to go down. And right. so that's a very tangible objective metric to say, well, did we get the results that we're trying to achieve? And um, you know, that path to get there can be difficult because controlling all, a ver all the variables in a world of infinite amount of variables is very difficult. And so trying to fine tune that as much as possible um, is the way to go. And it's um, it's just uh, it's just a tough thing, and so I think like um, I just like want to I basically want to think in terms of like the connectedness to things like I said in holistic systems. It's hard to describe what is the whole, you know. So it's right. like you have this membrane here. Maybe this like community is highly productive. And like everyone's living happy and healthy and like they're they've got a strong thriving economy but if it's at the detriment of the surrounding area that's that's not a whole system you know and so this is i think now where we're collaborating on larger scales internationally and we have the digital tools and more and more people are getting opened up through the internet there's something else that's happening that is i mean it's just like we there hasn't been a whole lot of like theorization to what does that mean and what does that look like now? Um, it, like, what, what does that really mean? Because it's, it's the, the boundaries and, the, and everything, it's just kind of beginning to slowly wash away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we also have um, in numeracy and a bunch of other things, it's a little bit like um, the books on behavioral econ that are telling us that, you know, we're full of all sorts of bias uh, and we, we don't, respond to the right things very often we don't stop and slow down and think through the situation so i was just like what if we lived in a datocracy where evidence-based decisions were kind of king except the conversation around what constitutes evidence how reliable is the data what is a good experiment what are we going to do about it what is the right policy measure each of those questions is like thorny and difficult but wouldn't it be cool to be living in that world where when somebody said, hey, hey, you all, we think that this is happening, but really, if you look at the stats, it's not, it's kind of this thing over here that's happening, right? I think that's, I think that'd be really pretty interesting. Yeah, it would. I, I think that people should be free to explore science the way that science is meant to be studied. I don't think that that's necessarily happening right now. Yeah. I wouldn't say that as a scientist myself, going through university that I was really encouraged to challenge the status quo by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the whole process of get, like getting a doctorate degree is the process of finding your facet of the fractal leading edge of your discipline and, and being an expert in that thing. And every so often one in a thousand of those people bends the discipline in some new direction. Right, Change, changes the whole discipline, but mostly everybody's finding their voice and their way and their their slice of expertise within the general ongoing view of the discipline. And it's hard to find advisors who will back you if you're bucking the discipline. Right, right? you won't make your way through so easily. Yeah, it's challenging. It's interesting. It is. It is. So, so how do we solve that as a general purpose thing? Well, I mean, I know for sure what we were saying kind of before we started recording is the divisive nature of these narratives, right? And so it's like how I was saying with the, the consensus is that the systems aren't working very well. Most people agree to that. And so the fact that we can get most people to agree on something, that's, I think that's powerful, right? But the problem is we are pointing fingers and we're not coming from a place of unity. We're coming from a place of separation. And so that's why I kind of say the word conscious again, some of these newer terms like awareness and awake and all that's just like, it gets convoluted, but, but the point of it is that an aware intelligence of being has a broader scope of a view 
of what's happening. So it's like, it's just the scale at which you observe, right? Because, you know, in science, we try to, we tend to draw this imaginary box and we're going to say like, we're going to study everything in here and just make the assumption that it's not connected to anything outside of this imaginary line that we've constructed. Right. And so I think that's where the fundamental flaw is happening. Exactly. Um, so, so here's in my brain, Keteris Paribus, and then underneath, underneath it, um, Keteris Paribus is bullshit. I'm not sure what Keteris is. So Keteris Paribus means all other things being equal. Mm, okay. So when you set up an experiment, you often say, we're going to look at this, all other things being equal, then we're going to, and, and it's like that assumption was a really bad assumption because those other things are also moving and also affecting your experiment. So that's partly what I guess this article is saying, Knowledge, Confusion, and Manipulation, a talk by Felix Stalder. Yeah, that looks good. So interesting. I forget that I even put this in. When did I put this in? 2019. Huh. Um, I'll connect this to today's call, which and, uh, is over here. Kind of going back to what you were speaking in relation to ergonomics, mm -hmm. ERGO ergonomics, um, and the pilots and fitting in the size and stuff. I think that is also true for how we interact with our devices and, <clears throat> excuse me, our online spaces. Spaces <clears throat> aren't ergonomically customizable, so. I kind of envision these modularized components where you can have a user interface for the same application be different for different personalities and different yep. learning styles and things like that. You know, well, because we had we had doing that with ourselves so much yet. It's just like here's the UI yeah. you get. Right. Like, it doesn't work for you, and it's you know, and so then we're bouncing around a bunch of months a bunch a bunch of different applications that are only accomplishing part of what we want to do, and so and it's very siloed. You know, you can't, your behavior amongst one app like Yelp doesn't affect Uber, doesn't affect this. You know, imagine if there was actually a universal single sign-on that could bridge those silo gaps as well as a database that could be collectively shared mm -hmm. um, and still maintain the privacy that we want to have and the security that we need. Right, right. There was a time some, a decade ago maybe, when skins were really popular. <laughs> yeah. And you could skin your Napster app to look like whatever, or your instant messaging app and all that. And it gave a lot of customization, but that, that moment seems to have passed a bit. Um, although like Gmail has themes, I just don't know how many people notice or realize that Gmail has themes and you can change them. So my Gmail background changes with the weather all the time. That's cool. So yeah, so my, my, my Gmail frame looks like what the weather is outside. Well, I don't know why, why I like it so much. Um, but we don't get a lot of customization. And there's a lot of conversation happening around OGM and around us in terms of um, those boundaries between different applications. It's a little bit what you just said about why don't I get to choose which of these is my favorite to use and how do I, how do I compose a work environment from my favorite elements, right? The composability or modularity of elements. And, and we, we, we spent a bunch of time on this, uh, I guess, yesterday in, uh, in the Free Jerry's Brain Call about swapping out Zoom chat, right? So, so we tried many moons ago. Uh, we have Mattermost servers. You're on those. And we tried to get everybody to stop using the Zoom chat and to just chat over on Mattermost. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the calls chat for, for the calls, and, and I mean, all, most of our standing calls had their own channel on Mattermost, which is lovely because then you can go back and you can scroll through every time. You don't have this separate little text file that, that's context-free, except not everybody who'd show up for the call was on Mattermost. So getting, hurting people over there was hard. And then we just, we just the discipline was too hard to maintain, so we don't do it anymore. And my, my assertion was, if Zoom permitted you to swap out this chat for some other chat you like, and it just bolted in, the, it'd be a no-brainer because then when you set up the call, you configure it to whatever chat you're using and they basically bond when you show up and you're on your way, but, but it doesn't do that. They don't do that. And I, I'm trying to figure out how do you encourage vendors to write for that? Yeah. How, do we, how do we get a composable environment out of well, some of I these mean, piece parts? 
that's what drew me to the, the, the community that I'm involved with now, which is hollow chain and taking an agent centric approach. So instead of the global consensus, like we, the ledger has to be full synced on all the nodes and everyone has to agree to some universal, you know, truth. Yeah. It's, it's an agent centric approach and they, that framework is also allows for modularity in ways that are unprecedented and with newer web three tools that will be coming out the way I envision a decentralized architecture now opens the door for bridging those what were previous silos. And so now instead of 25 apps that you have to have, you can have three or four or five mini operating systems that are all run off of the cloud. They're all a decentralized backend. And so really it's like, you're just downloading a mini operating system as opposed to like some siloed application. And I think that that has huge implications for the future of the internet and how we interact with software. Interesting. Um, I'm friends with um, Arthur Brock from way, way long ago, but I've really not caught up with Holo for a long time. How, like, where is the project now? Um, I'm not sure. They just came out with a roadmap. Um, and so that's probably the best route to just take a look at their the dev pulse that they do. Um, they do a good job of updating developers and. Um, you know, they came out with a newer roadmap after they did a code rewrite and everything. And so now it's like, there's a lot more additional features that they rolled out with. Um, but I don't, I don't follow that so much because I'm really just, my focus is on um, developing applications, hollow chain applications and other tools, open source tools for reputation. Right, right now I'm working on a project called Trustgraph, which is, um, I can post that link to it. Thanks which is, um, you know, related to this idea that we've been talking about is like, you know, how, how do we, how do we handle this kind of stuff? So is this link the best link for the new roadmap? Um, I'll check it out. Thanks. Yes, that's the one. Sweet. Um, and have you ever heard of an app called Adam, the agent centric DAP meta ontology? Yes, that's also another project I'm looking to get involved with. Oh, no kidding. God so, damn. Okay. I'm open with Nicholas Luck, and um, I'm waiting to continue that conversation. Harlan, and, and who I'm working with on Trustgraph, is going to be collaborating. I'm very interested in collaborating with him. So it looks like there, you know, oh, I'm hoping there'll be some synergy there because that's a great project. It's really, it's a spanning layer. So it's a meta ontology. And the big, like, uh, passion I had when I first jumped into Holochain many years back was Scepter. And so Scepter yeah. is kind of describing this decentralized operating system I'm talking about. And it's an, it's an artificial neural network. And so, you know, Adam is I think, to be in conjunction with that, given that there's this meta ontology um, in terms of how these different ecosystems um, can communicate with themselves. So the idea is to really actually bring about a system for interoperability, like true interoperability. So here's Scepter in my brain here. It, and, and I met with Eric Harris Braun and Arthur back in the days of their metacurrency project and was listening to that. And, and Scepter was a spin out from that and Holochain is a spin out from that. E each time I think cleaving off pieces that seemed doable um, to go build, but metacurrency ran really, really deep. I mean, I, they, you know, when, when they dove down the rabbit hole, I couldn't dive as far down as they were going, explaining you know, what this thing was and how it worked. But they're building from those philosophical foundations. And here's how I found Adam, is that I had put in this ontological project by this GitHub user, but I know very little about it, except it got mentioned on one of our free jury's brain calls a while ago. That's why I even know about it. Yep, it's a it's a backend agnostic tool, so it could you know use Holochain, IPFS, any of the um, any of the databases. It doesn't matter um, which people are using for the backend. It's really just a connect connectivity. Um, so interesting. Yeah, yeah, it, it uses the RDF triples, so the uh, subject predicate object. Yeah. In terms of creating. Um, you know, graphing and relational databases. And that's what I'm very interested in, in doing, like in conjunction with trust graph and these um, verifiable claims, these trust claims that people can cryptographically sign. And so it helps like protect sources, private sources from people. Is this the right trust graph, by the way? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. I'm connected to our call. Yeah, trust Adam. Yeah. 
I'm going to connect Adam to our call. Yeah. Um, huh. I mean, part of the part of the issue with Holochain has been a platform, a stable enough platform for people to write apps on, and I think it's gotten there, but I'm not actually sure. Yeah, I mean, they they have uh, they have working Holochain applications. Uh, for sure. What I would like to see is I'd like to see a lot more open source code. And so that's what the mission I'm on is to, uh, to write it myself. Now I had to learn a new language. It's written in a, a language called Rust, which is a, um, not as many people are familiar with, but it has a lot of advantages. I'm a huge fan of it. And so I had to learn that and study, do some studying. Plus I'm newer to software development. I mean, so you're a Rustation coding. now. Yeah, I'm a Rustation now. I had coding experience from engineering. I mean, I taught myself how to code on my TI-83 calculator when I was in junior high. Yeah. And I've always played around with circuits. I was, I'm an engineer is my background, but when it comes to just software development specifically, I'm a, I was a total noob. So I've been spending many, uh, many months now studying and now I'm actually ready to go ahead and begin the work. And so, yeah, my, my plan is to continue to contribute to the Holochain Open modules and so they have these different um things that people can take and build right and um what i want to do is automate that process so i'm a huge proponent for uh low code no code tools yeah because i believe that if the that non-technical people have the ability to create applications we're going to see a totally different shift in how things are done because yeah you know, I don't know if you've, in the OGM community, a mutual friend of ours is Vincent Arena, who's fresh out of school. And he went and first used Airtable and now he's using Bubble, but he's used low code, no code tools to build out a really big, beautiful directory that goes really quite deep. Yeah, I think he's done a, a really nice job. And um, so yeah, with Trove and uh, everything. And so yeah. that, uh, that's those tooling, those tools are very fundamental um, for, what, what we need to be able to synergize ourselves on a broader scale. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that he's doing that work and, and everything. So how can I bring myself up to date on that part of these architectures? Like, and I'm not a coder. I mean, I, I can program hello world and probably I used to be able, sorry, my first computer in the world was an Apple II plus. And one of my questions back then was, why are there so many programming languages? So I started collecting interpreters and compilers. And by the time I retired it out for the first Macintosh, um, I had you know a couple of Pascals and Forth and Mumps and uh, Modula 2, and I don't remember what the hell else. It was really fun. And I could write Hello World on all those, plus I could write Hello World on IBM mainframe and make it run. And beyond that, I've done nada. Yeah. But, but, but just, that context has been in, incredibly helpful to me in understanding what else is going on and being an analyst, a tech analyst in the software, you know, software world and all that. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how to jump into the middle of these conversations about modularity, agent architectures, composability, model view controller. I don't know. There's a, there's a whole bunch of things here that different communities are trying to solve in different ways because they have different philosophical perspectives on what's right and, and, and how to fix it. And I, I don't need to master all those things, but I'm trying to make wise choices between them. Yeah, well, I'm inexperienced myself I, and I don't you know, use social media and pay attention so much. I have not worked for corporations really. So like, you know, I've been unplugged. And so I, I don't know how to answer that in terms of like the industry level and what's out there and what's standard, how to, because I'm lost as well in terms of how to like assimilate into this. Um, I'm more of an algorithm person. My background is like math and data and analytics, complex systems theory. I had experience, um, you know, researching and doing reports for cryptography. So I'm more knowledgeable in blockchain cryptography um, as opposed to you know, really where the tech industry is in general and these different tools. I will just say from my view, it's convoluted. And I tend to just like, anytime I see something that's really like overtly complex, I tend to think that maybe there's just alternative options because 
you know, like I see these white papers, it's like, and we're going to do this and we got this and this and there's all this fancy math. And like, I understand what the fancy math is saying and I'm reading them and I'm like, do they even know what they're talking about? Like, what is going on? Like, but if you look at like, you know, nature, it's just an elegant, like there's just an elegant flow and a pattern and a rhythm. It's not so, you know, complicated of a situation. And so I try to think of that, you know, like an elegant equation, like E equals MC squared even though that's probably a bad example because it's not really necessarily accurate, but it's just like, in terms of the simplicity factor of it, um, that's kind of what I tend to think. And so, you know, it's like, if it's so difficult, the barrier of entry is so high to building technology that benefits these corporations, right? It Completely. doesn't help us as a collective. So Completely. I want to really significantly reduce that barrier of entry. And so I wish I could... Um, be more helpful other than you know <laughs> well but i usually just hop into discord and ask questions and sometimes people will give you great links like the hollow chain discord you can go in and they'll answer your questions they're happy to like point people in directions yeah. got the core concepts now they use like biology so they've got zones and dna and the visuals and so you know they're doing a they're doing a good job of, of helping explain it in ways that like you know, make sense and have more visuals and stuff. So I love that. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I mean, you're it's clearly, more concepts, you know? you're clearly an, 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 an independent itinerant sense maker, which is, which is lovely. Right. Um, and, and doesn't matter to me that you haven't been inside the corporate world and all that kind of stuff, because mostly they're 20 years behind everything and you're curious and you're going from community to community, like a bumblebee, like, Ooh, look, pollen. Um, <laughs> And, and you're a cross-pollinator and, and, and sort of hoping to try to build a hive in the middle of this that makes more sense or that puts things out in the public commons. In the, well, um, Stacey's been part of a bunch of conversations we've had in OGM about the, gener we call it the generative commons, yes. uh, right? And I love the regenerative frame uh, around a whole bunch of things, but I, I, I didn't want to call it the regenerative commons because like generativity seems like a, a, a good thing. Uh, yeah. So we had a bunch of, of calls. Here's a, we had a bunch of calls around trying, trying to create a generative commons agreement or, or something like that, um, which you can find here. I'll connect the generative commons agreement to our call today. Um, but I think that the, 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 the actions that you're, the, the approach you're taking to finding your way through this is like kind of the right approach. It's like, you know, um, go, go smell the different flowers, see which ones feel right, feel, yeah. feel, see which ones fit the architecture of society that you think needs to exist, right? And then go push them until they break and see where, how solid are they and how, how broken are they? And then maybe buzz around some more to get broader perspective on what neighboring communities are doing or what might be different approaches to do this. And, and at some point in the next decade, I think, a bunch of these efforts will kind of crystallize and connect to the point where we have a new platform. But I was, I was just on a thought, my doubts about NFTs and NFT games, and I have a thought called obfuscation through complexity is a great way to mask fraud or mistakes, which goes back to my diagnosis of the global financial crisis where ever more abstract securities were impossible to understand, but everybody else was buying them. So others were forced to join. This is like a perfect global scam. Like, like the, the global financial crisis was the perfect global scam because, because the math was faulty inside the securities. They had higher returns because they had higher returns. You would get fired if you didn't buy them. And because everybody was buying them, there was a whole big pool of money in the middle that if you got off the, the merry-go-round before everybody else did, you would do really, really well. It turns out that, that smart capitalists don't like stability. <laughs> they like beta. Beta is volatility, right? Mm -hmm. And that, those, are the, those are the people we have, in, you know, society is in their hands right now. Sorry, Stacey. That's okay. I have to leave, but Zeke, it was a pleasure to meet you and I hope you come back. I yeah. really, I really yeah. mean it. I'll see you on Mattermost, right? You're in Mattermost. Yeah, please feel free to uh, send me a message. Bye -bye. I'll, I'll look cool. And I hadn't noticed that we come past Yara. See you, see you Stacey. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we can we can wrap our call too. But um, yeah.
Um, well, you know, when it's like duplicating efforts is not necessarily a bad thing. Like if you have an experiment, you might want to do several iterations in different branches, but I'm trying to help us like minimize or maximize our resource allocation and yeah. optimize that flow. And to know that if we are duplicating efforts, then it's intentional and it's for, we can use that information somewhere else later right now it's just like you go down this line and then you're there and then yep. where all that value it just is so much untapped value just sitting there so ideally like minimizing duplicating efforts in ways that don't make sense is really what i'm trying to help figure out how to do because you know after i get an idea of this and um figure out whether to you know where to plug into a team and stuff i'm just going to lock myself in a lab for quite a while and just go to go after it so i love that um and, and i i, I, I want to know i want to learn what you're learning so i want to follow whatever where um where are you are you you're not on the major platforms are you publishing posting videos or anything about what you're learning no not yet maybe eventually i'm not sure uh have yeah about that yeah, because I'd love I'd love to be like in your wake going, oh, that was really cool. <laughs> but I can tell you that. So uh, my friend Denise, she um, put on this group Awaken Dream Synergy. That's how I met a lot of like the conscious technologists that I'm working with now. And what they want to do is they like conversations like this. They can generate an artificial intelligence can generate artwork from it and then right. make an NFT out of it. And so in that NFT you can have additional things. It's not just necessarily the art, but you can have membership and other access to things or discounts on stuff can be baked into the smart contract. Yep. But what's really cool, I'm thinking like if I was someone that wanted to buy an NFT, if I wanted to sponsor this, that's exactly what I, what I would want is I would want to be going to fund people that are having these conversations, right? And, and you can do that now, right? So you can just like, the money goes there and you know that you've sponsored this conversation and then your reputation can be built into it. And then, then you, you, these, you know, there's a, now there's a filter into why is someone joining a call or joining a community in a space? And it's not just like who has the most money or this right. or that, but it's actually like you've earned like access to these different groups. And so what happens in that is the information in the calls is valuable, right? All of the things that we've learned. And so, when they purchase that, then now they also have access to that intellectual property. And so it's taking intellectual property and it's collectively um, stewarding those assets. So I'm totally torn about what you said, because it's a blend of stuff I'm thrilled about and completely agree with. And then a bunch of stuff that I'm like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> so the part that I'm thrilled about, for example, one of the pieces is, um, I don't know, eight or 10 months ago, my friend John Borthwick said, hey, Jerry, could, is OGM a DAO? And then he and another friend on the West Coast basically launched NFTs and they've got a lot of experience on this. And at one point I was asking John, could we have an NFT for OGM? And, and, and I think, and I think this is really parallel to what you just said, um, I think some investor would be really happy to buy an NFT that isn't a stupid pixel art picture of some apes or, or whatever, um, but instead is a snapshot of the nascent collective memory of civilization. This is what it looked like when it was like a little fetus with bulb eyes and a spinal cord and a tail. And then as it grows and evolves, you could take different snapshots and float them as NFTs. And because NFTs have smart contracts and, and future subsequent sales actually generate cash that goes back to the creator, which is not like any kind of art we've ever had before. Right. Right. That's a brand new, fantastic feature. I love that feature. I, I would think that having like a, a, a worthwhile NFT that does that kind of thing would be terrific. And that I, I, we didn't do anything with that conversation. So you're telling me that this, this community is doing that already? Yeah, that's what we're looking to do um, very shortly. They're working with um, like an NFT team that helps manage that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and so what it is, is like, as we are, you know, figuring out this collective sense making and collective governance, um, then that's valuable to future DAOs. And so the, I'll send you the PDF yeah. Um, on uh, uh, slides I came up with to kind of show, visually show this concept. But the idea is to support DAOs. So we want to help these DAOs start up. But the idea is that you don't want to scale too fast too soon. Right. You have to have the like underlying framework support infrastructure there to make it happen. And because right now it's just like, it seems like this crazy madhouse is running around. Oh, there's, there just needs to be a more grounded yeah. structure to it. And so the more we can get people to kind of like, 
put in their their value, put in their intellectual property, and collectively, you know, have that as a pie, then people can build off of that. It's like bootstrapping. The process. And that's the place where you lost me, where you where I fell off the back of the truck, so to speak. That's, I don't know why, but that metaphor I, I, I use a lot, um, which is. I'm a big believer that IP should be out there in the open to help everybody. And the idea of protecting it, locking it away, earning your way into getting the IP doesn't make any sense to me. And, right. and, and, and for me, NFTs are like the autograph, you know, the Babe Ruth autograph baseball card. I support Babe Ruth. Well, in, in which case, when you bought the Topps baseball card, you weren't supporting Babe Ruth. Although he might have gotten a royalty, who knows? But but in this case, NFTs can very directly support the communities that are busy churning out open intellectual property for everybody that is perfectly repli replicable at zero marginal cost. And that's fantastic. There's a bunch of people talking about how NFTs create and enforce scarcity. I can't stand that conversation. It makes me nuts. Sure. So I need to understand what you well, mean. I, because I agree and I disagree. So uh, okay, good. From, a, from, a under, from a fun, like a moral standpoint, I absolutely agree. Um, however, there's a challenge, and this is what I'm trying to figure out, so maybe you can help me, because open source projects have trouble gaining momentum and getting funding. It's very difficult to get that funding. Right. And so on the one hand, I would much rather everything be open. I don't, patents and intellectual property, I don't agree with that, really. But the problem that I'm seeing is that it's hard to incentivize people to want to sponsor those projects, and it's hard to like get funding for that. So if we can find a way to get funding, then great. But I'm just seeing it like this is it, if we have this like um, circle, circular thing, okay? And it's not centralized. Right. Okay, so it's not subject to the same corruption. So it's transparent and it's collectively owned. Then instead of being open source, it's actually like any organization that wants to have access to it can do, they could still have access for free. It's not necessarily that we have to charge. Although we could, right. but the idea is that they're saying, well, but we buy sustainable products. We are fair trade. We treat our employees this way. We, you know, we are transparent into where right. our money is going in our organization. So it's kind of like on the one hand, it's great to just give open free everything to everyone, but it's still not necessarily empowering, right? The, the, the proper uh, movement um, and groups and communities, because, you know, so I, I, I kind of like, I've always been terrible at debate class because I'm always like, yeah, you know, I can see both sides. And this is one that's really tough because yeah. on the one hand, I have many friends that are doing some amazing work in open source projects. And I'm very much looking forward to contributing as much as I possibly can to those. But on the other hand, I'm really tired of all the wrong people having all the money. Like, I'm just really tired of that. So like, um, I'm trying yeah. to figure out <laughs> what can we do with that? So, you know, I feel you, but I just like, at the same time, do want to see the right people being able to like take care of themselves and have the resources they need to really get the ball rolling on this stuff. Totally. I totally agree. Does that make sense? Yeah. That uh, makes total sense. So, and also one thing that we talked about in OGM over time, especially in that generative commons thing, is that high, well-functioning commons need some boundaries and need some protections because when anybody can go riff on the thing and copy it and then mash it up or drop a drop some malware into it or whatever else, that's not actually functional code anymore. It gets confused and you lose whatever the value was that was created in the middle. It's easy to bury or drown or, or whatever, or corrupt. Um, so, so stewardship needs some boundaries. On the other hand, if I had a choice between an NFT where, um, if I had a choice between one where the property IP was locked away or the IP was completely open, I would buy the NFT that was completely open. And it would just be a choice between NFTs in the marketplace. Like to me, it's like, why not try to float NFTs around completely open IP and see if people will invest because you're investing in the movement, not in the IP. Well, that would be the most ideal situation. And yeah. But has anybody done that? I, I don't think so, but you know, you it, what you're talking about could be a huge opportunity for crowdsourcing because you don't need a million dollars from one person if you can get one dollar from a million people, right? Bingo, so bingo. I think you're on something with that. And I definitely would be like very interested in figuring out how could we make that happen to get a bunch of people to put in a little bit to sponsor some open tools and intellectual property. Yeah, heck yeah. Like, 
So, <laughs> yeah. So if, if you're if you're getting close to a conversation with others about this and whatever, like, can you ring the bell and I'll like shine okay. the bat shine the bat signal, For sure. and, and I'll show up because I'm really really interested in this and I think that there's a pony here. I think that 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 this is a really good way to fund open source communities, artists, and others. But for me, it's not about scarcity and protecting the IP. It's in fact about releasing it. And I think, and this is an experiment we can run. I think there's people who will who will invest in those NFTs with that premise for those ethical reasons. Yeah, I mean, that would be the most ideal. It's just so far my limited experience recently, because I've only recently come back into like the real yeah. world. And um, I've been away or you can think of me like the caveman. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, my limited experience is just tough to get money for, for free yeah. stuff that you're yeah, getting yeah. for free. It's hard and you can't blame people for not being as incentivized, but I know that they're out there. I know that they exist. Yeah, I don't How know. How can we connect those people? Right. You know? I mean, Wikipedia, Wikipedia exists. And yet, if you had taken a business plan for Wikipedia to any venture capitalist 20 years ago, they would have laughed you out of the room, right? So some <clears> groups are doing it. And I know those people are out there. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. That's one of the questions I maybe would be a good question for people that have more knowledge and experience. Like, I want to hopefully talk to Pete Missy sometimes and sometimes soon ask him some questions about these things because like I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out exactly how to make this happen. Cool. Me too. Yeah. On the same quest. On the same quest. Yeah. Yeah. So who else should we talk? Who else is on the top of the list of people who would be wise on this? Um, well, just uh, XR Engine is an open source community um, creating open source metaverse tools, and they're all incredibly passionate about uh, open source software. Huh. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's some um, people I kind of talk to and ask questions here and there. Like I was even asking a question about like the protections that you mentioned and stuff. And so I'm trying to, you know, uh, here I'll post, post their link as well. Thanks. And then, you know, Holochain. Right. Um, I, again, I haven't talked to them so much about these kinds of things because like, I really want to focus on being able to, to code and to engineer. So my bandwidth for like the funding stuff, the non-technical mm -hmm. ideas and um, activities, I'm just, uh, I'm more limited at the moment, mm -hmm. just because I simply feel like the best service I can do for the collective is to be, you know, getting my hands dirty, jumping, diving in. Um, Makes sense. Things. Makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. But I'm really glad because like, I just want to make this happen. You yeah, know, exactly. And I and I don't care about anything else. Like it's not about me. It's so much bigger. It's just like yeah. the result. What is like can we, you know, achieve this outcome as a society? Uh, because I believe in unity. I don't believe in pointing fingers and divisiveness. Um, I, I really try to approach things from yeah. a place of compassion. And I would really like to see more people doing the same thing. You know, it's heartbreaking. And so, yeah. It's totally heartbreaking. <laughs> where, where did you grow up? Uh, in a small town in the Midwest. Uh-huh. Yep. Normal, Illinois. Normal. I've heard of normal. Never been there. Never yeah. been there. Closest I've ever lived is St. Louis. I could say I'm far from normal. Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I can say, show me. So I feel like living, I feel like living almost three years in, in Missouri gave me the right to use their motto. So. Right. Yeah. So, um, this is super cool. I'm thrilled you're here. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for having me. Let's keep the conversation going. And um, anything I can answer for you right now? Yeah, well, just I want to figure out how can I onboard to OGM because I'm just not even sure if I totally fully understand exactly what it is. We aren't either. Um, so you're on the Google group and you're on the Mattermost. Those are our two principal platforms. So you're seeing all the conversations. We have a Thursday morning call at nine at 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific every Thursday is our standing group call. About 25 people usually come in. Um, and we alternate between two formats. One is the traditional, traditional format of checking in, where I just look at my, my Zoom gallery view and I walk across and just call, I, I ask people what's going on in your life that has anything to do with o OGM. And then when, when they say something that sort of sparks a little bit, I'll, I'll dig in a little bit. 
and we just we might spend 25 minutes on the thing that the third call the third person you know raised and that that's perfectly okay and then the alternate format is a topic and i think this thursday is is another topic day um and so we've been picking different kinds of topics we had a couple really good calls on the metaverse um and i'm a i'm i'm a bit of a metaverse skeptic um i don't like mark zuckerberg's vision of the metaverse and i don't really like the web3 version of the metaverse and so i bought the betterverse.org mm -hmm. and on the idea of why don't we design a better verse together yeah i like that better verse i've heard yeah. holoverse but that's like too associated with holochain a company so I yeah think that better verse is great yeah, yeah exactly yeah, so 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 if you want to think out loud about that kind of stuff and you want to post on the betterverse site or it's just a google site it's really simple to edit and post stuff on and so forth okay let me know like if, if it appeals to you but but i feel like i've had i've got 24 years using this brain thing and i feel like i've been at the at the coal face for 24 years by myself and it's like hey everybody this is really fun to do where are you all right and why can't we build something like Wikipedia, but with opinions and narratives above Wikipedia and all the other assets out on the inner tubes? Why can't we build that thing together? Yeah, yeah, that's and then, what I'm about. That's what I want to do. And then tell stories on this medium and, and figure out like what to do. I want to build that sucker. That's exactly what I'm looking to do. <laughs> like, awesome. Okay. So, <laughs> so I, I may have just gotten some funding to build some a little lightweight straw man prototype for some part of this. And as soon as I've wrapped my brains around it, I'll probably come back and, and talk to you. Cause I like, if you're enthused and this is like a common vision, then. Yeah, for sure. Know. Definitely. I mean, this is really the crux, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yep. It's, it's, this is what makes sense. And, um, you know, I, I haven't I've unfortunately been able to attend any of the massive wiki calls. The mornings are really tough for me, um, uh, the early morning. So, but, uh, like I do want to figure out like if the, what is in conjunction with Massive Wiki. I have been talking a lot with Wendy McLean, and so cool. I know there's a ton of overlap with what she's doing with Tapestry and everyone's wisdom. And so I told her I was like, "You have the front end for what I want to build the back end for." So like, seems like maybe let's figure out how these things out. fit. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Love that. Cool. cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Appreciate, appreciate it. Bye.